for the introduction and good afternoon everyone. I realize that I am the only person standing between you and dinner and drinks, so I will try not to be too terribly boring. Um, this presentation is uh, actually a joint work between uh, myself and uh, uh, my friend Eric. Uh, I am uh, from uh, Politecnico di Milano, which is a large university uh, in Milan, Italy, uh, which, uh, as you probably know, is the third largest Italian city. The first it largest Italian city is Rome, and the second largest is Sao Paulo in uh, Brazil, uh, where <laughs> five million Italians live, and two millions live in, in Milano. So um, Eric uh, is a uh, Canadian and uh, uh, works uh, in a company that he founded called Linklayer Labs. Uh, he's the uh, actual automotive uh, uh, security domain expert. Uh, unfortunately, while uh, Brazilians like Italians a lot, so we can get a visa on arrival, Brazilians do not like Canadians as much. And uh, uh, in particular, uh, in this uh, um, uh, past autumn, uh, Brazilian uh, visa uh, officers around the world went on strike precisely in the weeks where Eric should have applied for his visa. So Eric is not here thanks to bureaucracy, uh, but uh, he surely is without, with us in, uh, in spirit. Um, so, um, meaning alcohol. So. Um, <laughs> The topic that I would like to talk about is automotive insecurity. So if you have already followed presentations on the subject, please uh, bear with me for the first five minutes while I bring everybody else to speed on the same subject. Um, and also, uh, I do realize that uh, um, I, I, I mean, uh, there is a, um, a language barrier, but uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions. There's no need to wait for the end of the presentation. I like to get questions even in the middle. And you can try asking them in Portuguese if you speak very, very slowly and very, very clearly. Um, so the automotive world is uh, uh, basically a very weird beast because modern vehicles are actually networks uh, of computers traveling on wheels. Um, you can find uh, even hundreds, more unreasonably tens and tens, of ECUs, uh, electronic control units, inside each vehicle that um, basically have been there for ages running things like uh, injection control, uh, the automatic gear shifting, um, but also uh, interesting things for the passenger, such as the control of uh, electronic doors or uh, the controls of the infotainment system. They have just uh, grown from being very simple controls to more complex computers. For instance, when ABS was introduced, ABS was a control system that was significantly more complicated than previous control systems. And over time, they basically became a, a network of computers of varying level of sophistication. Starting from the infotainment unit in front of you when you enter a modern vehicle, which is by all means uh, an all-purpose computer, uh, running some versions of software that can even play videos, uh, they can uh, host the games and do different things. Uh, if you happen to, for instance, board a Tesla, the most prominent feature of a Tesla is an enormous video screen which runs your browser, it allows you to connect to the internet, and so on and so forth. Um, but also all of the ECUs that you don't really see have become more complex, and they are actual computers. So um, this is uh, interesting because this obviously opens up the question about the security of the automotive network, of the network of these computers that runs through the car. And uh, um, this network uh, can uh, take the form of different types of protocols. You most often will hear me and the other people that talk about automotive security talk about CAN, Controller Area Network, which is kind of the dominant standard. So when I'm talking here, sometimes you will hear me talking about CAN, but most of what I say applies also to other standards that are used in automotive. Uh, there's another standard called the LIN. There's another standard called Automotive Ethernet. Ethernet, uh, which is very similar to the Ethernet that we use in, uh, in offices and buildings. 
Um, but whatever I'm talking about applies across the different, uh, uh, the different uh, uh, networks, unless I say specifically something to the contrary. Um, so actually, what is the most common, the most famous type of cyber attack, of uh, electronic attack against cars? Theft. Most of the car modern cars cannot be really stolen unless you bypass a series of security protections. These security protections have been bypassed for ages. We have never thought of that as a cyber attack. But it is actually an electronic digital computer attack. So um, there's videos, if you just, uh, um, if you just uh, Google up, uh, I didn't know about the connectivity here, so I didn't put actually the video link in, in the slides. But um, if you Google up uh, hacker steal, three minutes and you will find that BMW, Audi, it's not necessarily just that brand, see um, um, attackers uh, stealing the cars. There's both demonstrations, uh, such as this one that I'm uh, quoting here, but there's also actual videos taken from surveillance cameras of people breaking into cars and stealing them. So this has been going on for a while. We never thought of it as a, as a computer security problem, but it actually is, as I will show uh, later. Uh, then, a few years ago, I was actually lucky enough to catch the very first presentation on this. In 2010, at an uh, um, academic security conference called the IEEE Security and Privacy Symposium that takes place every year. Now it takes place in different places, but it used to take place every year in Auckland, so you will hear computer scientists such as myself call it Auckland for short. Um, in this conference, a group of researchers from University of California, San Diego, uh, led by Stephen, uh, Stephen Savage, uh, who's a famous colleague uh, uh, working there, uh, presented a first analysis of how you could control an, uh, a vehicle, a car, um, by accessing its network. So they basically created this software that they called the Car Shark, like Wireshark, uh, but for cars, and uh, showed that if you connected to the CAN, to the network the, of the vehicle, you could control all sorts of critical, uh, of critical equipment. Why? Because the equipment would believe uh, anything that you told it. Um, so long story short, um, during scientific conferences, it's not as relaxed that, as hacker conferences. You have people that raise their hand and that try to ask difficult questions because they want to uh, verify or to help actually challenge the solidity of what you're presenting. It happens also in hacker conferences sometimes, but we are more relaxed usually. Um, and we also get feedback and critique much better than most academics, by the way. So. Um, one of the critiques was, OK, but you demonstrated us that the car can be taken over if somebody connects to the, to the network of the vehicle. That's kind of lame. You should so show us that somebody can do that without actually connecting physically to the network of the vehicle. Lo and behold, in 2011, the same group presented a way to compromise a vehicle by giving the owner an audio CD with an MP3 player track that was malformed and would exploit a vulnerability in the reader and from there access the can and do the same stuff that they had done in 2010. So that was the first original set of papers. You can still find them. The group is called Autosec, and it's autosec.org, like automotive security, autosec.org. You go there, you can download the papers, and they are beautiful papers, some of the best scientific papers in our field. Um, then, a few years later, uh, a couple of researchers uh, called uh, uh, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, that I'm sure you know better because they are more from the hacker background, um, on, at different conferences, starting from DEF CON and then uh, at Black Hat in different uh, editions of conferences, replicated first the same type of attacks. And then, uh, last, uh, in the last couple of years, they showed something different. They showed that you could actually do the same thing without ever touching the car, just from remote. Why is this possible? This is possible because on most automotive networks nowadays, there are components that connect remotely. So for instance, if you have a very modern car from a Mercedes, 
uh, you have uh, the, uh, the usually in any vehicle from Mercedes now you have a button that if you if you click it will connect you with a call center transmitting data from the car to the call center that data that that unit that connects you to the outside is connected to the can so there is an interface between the inside of the vehicle and the outside um, but uh, moreover, if you have any vehicle manufactured in the United States, most often you can have an option that is uh, called OnStar, that is basically a remote assistance, a remote maintenance uh, feature. This has the same thing. It has a modem, it has a data modem inside connected to the can of the vehicle. I don't know about Brazil, but in Italy, for instance, there's a lot of uh, um, insurances that will give you a black box to put in your vehicle. It's basically a, a small device, it's a small embedded device, which has an accelerometer, a GPS, so that they can track the vehicle if stolen, they can check what acceleration the vehicle was subject to in case of an accident. And some of the measurements that this thing takes, it takes from the can, so it's connected to the can. Okay, so in most modern vehicles, there are devices that are connected to the outside and connected to the can. And this is what uh, was used uh, in the very famous uh, um, experiment by Valasek and Miller, where they took control of a Jeep that was actually being driven, and uh, uh, they basically were able to control it from remote. And uh, last year, and, and uh, sorry, and this year, they presented research where they showed that they were able to do this even when the vehicle was actually running. So, um, for safety reasons, not for cybersecurity, but for safety reasons, uh, many of the ECUs will not allow you to do some types of operations, uh, typically operations of, uh, that uh, uh, are uh, required for testing or for reprogramming, cannot be run while the car is moving. While the car is moving, the ECUs are in a state that do not allow you to do several types of things. Um, but they showed that you can actually bypass these safety features and so reprogram some of those uh, equipments even if the car is moving. Uh, this is another example uh, of a hack uh, um, found by Troy Hunt, who is another famous uh, uh, researcher, that showed that he was able to take control of Nissan Leaf uh, cars everywhere by just knowing the vehicle identification number, which is a very long string of digits, but it's not meant to be a secret. It is being used by a lot of vendors as a secret, but it's not meant to be. So in some vehicles, this secret appears like printed in the, um, in the window of the car as a, VN, as a mean of identifying the part. So it's, it's not, because it's not meant to be a secret. It's meant to be something that is, I mean, you cannot see a car passing by and guess the VIN. But if you are targeting someone, you can actually find out what that VIN is. So um, basically, what are the attack vectors that I have talked about and that we have seen in the last, in the last five years? Well, we have seen some attacks that require physical access to the networks of the vehicle. And here, let me disabuse you immediately of a misconception. It's not so difficult to access the network of a vehicle. First, you can have scenarios such as the malicious mechanic. If you bring the car for maintenance, whoever does maintenance. But you know, who does maintenance? There's a lot of ways to alter your car which do not entail reprogramming the ECUs. Um, but for instance, whenever you connect an aftermarket part, the black box, the um, insurance black boxes that I was talking about, those are not manufactured by the manufacturer of the car. They are not official parts. You connect them. Nowadays, there's a lot of parts that require you to connect uh, the aftermarket part, something that you bought in a supermarket, to the so-called OBD2 port <coughs> under the dashboard of the vehicle. Each vehicle uh, must be equipped, due to some regulations that I will not go into detail, with an OBD2 port that is basically a port that allows diagnostic access to the vehicle internal network. That is required to be there, among other reasons, for competition, in order to avoid Mercedes or Audi um, making you go only to a Mercedes shop for maintenance. If you have an, an OBD2 port open, most mechanics can attach 
an instrument, of course, the instruments that the OEM gives to their own dealers are better, maybe, but they cannot touch an instrument there and read data from your car. <coughs> but this means uh, that any aftermarket part that connects there has an unrestricted access to your car's network. Also, uh, in, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, um, cars are predicated on the uh, assumption that if you get into the car, if you are inside the vehicle, you are authorized. The security of vehicles start with perimeter security. If you are inside, you are supposed to be authorized. That's why the OBD support is really available, because if you are inside, it means that you are authorized. But this is not true. This is not true anymore. Think of car sharing. Think of rentals. It has always not been true. But rentals are a different thing. Car sharing is a much more dynamic uh, episode where you can be almost anonymous in having a car and using it, and you have access to all of these features. Many of those lines, uh, those can lines, uh, are physically accessible from the outside. There's one specific type and brand of car. I will not uh, say it aloud because I'm being recorded. But there's one specific type of brand of car. You can Google it up. It's the most stolen car in Europe. And the reason why it's the most stolen car in Europe is that you can break a specific part of the car and access a can line behind this part of the car and reprogram the car so that it opens and it starts. So physical access to the, the networks is not so difficult in a vehicle. But of course, the much more scary part comes when you can wirelessly access the, the vehicle, either from locally, because there's Bluetooth access, or because there are sensors on the vehicle that use a, a radio access. So they can be used to access the vehicle for a short distance. But then there are GSM uh, combiners, GSM modems on many vehicles that can be accessed from really remote, from anywhere in the world, like in the Nissan Leaf app by Troy Hunt. We were, it was able to control features of cars regardless of where they physically were. Many cars nowadays have a mobile application that you can install on your phone and even remotely control some parameters of your car. Those applications, how, how do you think those applications work? The cars are connected to the internet in some way or another. Right? You had a question? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's quite similar to the CAN bus. Uh, in modern cars, you have a CAN bus role, which is Victor, at the sure. request. And uh, you actually can connect to, uh, just like directly, you can connect, as an example, to the brakes controller. I will get to that. I, uh, can, can I answer your question during the presentation? Because I, I get precisely to that point. Well, it's CAN bus. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's precisely the point. Um, so, the attack vectors are many, and if you look at it, the attack narrative, what happens in the attacks, is always the same thing. It's always the same thing. Find vulnerability for access. Either you access the car physically or you find a wireless device that has a weak controls. Compromise that. Once you are on the CAN, once you are on the network of the car, you can talk to all the devices on the network and the devices on the network are built and programmed believing that nobody else but the cars is you are going to be on the network. That's something that if you design for a living networks in uh, office environments or enterprise environments, it's something that should basically erase the bumps, the bumps on your skin. Because that's precisely what you don't do. You don't assume that your network is completely attacker free. You try to segment the network. You try to build each single thing so that it can be a little bit resilient to somebody, some attacker being on the same network. Cars network are built thinking that no attacker, no uh, unauthorized entity is going to be on the network. So if there is a, um, a message running on the network saying A, all of the ECUs will believe it's A. It will, they will believe it's authenticated. Some have built in uh, uh, resilience because sometimes uh, an ECU may break. So there is some built-in resilience because of safety. You don't want an ECU to go mad 
and just uh, um, create, up, create a problems with the handling of the car. But that's all there is. You never, you never designed cars believing that an active attacker would be on that network. So if you get access to the can, it's kind of game over with current, with current cars. It's kind of game over because they think that there's never going to be an intruder on that network. And so at that point, you can do whatever. So all of those different attacks are really all the same thing. They are beautiful. I'm not demeaning those. They are beautiful and they raise the tension to a problem. But they really all show the same thing. You break into one of the perimetral uh, controls, you get into the can, and from there you can do anything. You can reprogram the car, you can uh, steer it, depending on the features of the car. A very old car probably will not allow you to really steer the car. Whereas an, an, a modern car that is uh, uh, basically uh, already uh, fitted for being controlled by sensors can be probably uh, controlled very, um, very extensively from remote. <coughs> so one of the interesting things is what happened? It, it's actually, it actually resonates on what, what uh, was said just before in the previous talk about biases. When you find a vulnerability in a car, how do you patch it exactly? So Fiat Chrysler, the guys from the uh, hack on the Jeep, came up with this. They sent every owner of a, a Jeep that could be potentially affected a USB, car, a USB key that the owner was supposed to insert into the car to activate the reflashing of the uh, involved units. Can anybody spot why this is a terrible, terrible idea? Because we are training users to receive in their mail a suspicious looking uh, USB key with a program that will actually rewrite the firm of the car and plug it in, no questions asked. <laughs> this, is, this, is a this is an astonishingly bad idea. So on the plus side, you have to give to them that they wanted to avoid having, uh, sending each of their owners to the dealer to have the update. But this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea, where, however you will look at it. So since this is a bad idea, and sending people to the dealer is a much better idea, that creates an issue. And the issue is the issue of so-called non-reactions. So this is an XKCD comic that, is actually, that actually explains very well what I, mean, what I mean. Urgent critical update available. Details fixes an issue that was causing random laptop electrical fires. Kind of Note 7 prescient thing. This update requires you restarting your computer. Ah, yes, tell me later. I'm not going to do it now. Just think of the same, but with a car, and having to take the car to the dealer and leave it there for a couple of hours. Later, much later. So if you think of patching cars, the most likely thing that could happen, in the most positive word, is that you can patch them early when people take them in for their yearly check, if they do it. That's the most, uh, the most reasonable thing. You cannot really think that you are going to, up to update and patch cars, unless you take uh, the Tesla route. Tesla cars can be updated from remote uh, for all their firmware. So when you park your Tesla in your, uh, in your garage, you are supposed uh, to have a Wi-Fi connection there so that your car during the night can patch itself. That's not the future that I wanted to live in. But still, uh, that's, that's much better than not being able to patch anything. Except for the fact that this obviously means that there is a component on the Tesla network inside the car that can reach all of the ECUs and patch all of those. So I really sincerely hope that they designed that very well. <coughs> And the result that you get if you cannot patch things is what we have observed yesterday. Thank you, whoever you are, uh, for this example. With the Internet of Toasters, IoT, um, bombarding sites 
with a denial of service. Why? Because taking control of these devices is easy. Patching them is very hard. I don't want to be there to witness a botnet of cars doing this. So in summary, what we, can, what, what we have uh, shown until here is we cannot rely on patching the single vulnerabilities because A, we will be at that for ages. If we wait for each single hacker in the to go, go home, dismantle their car, you will find a vulnerability. It will take time, it will take uh, effort, you will probably not do that. But in general, all of those cars, all of those automotive networks are very vulnerable. They are relatively easy to exploit. Once again, not diminishing the technical skills of those that have shown the exploits. But if we go ahead, we can exploit those vulnerabilities one at a time for a very long time. That's not the way we fix the problem. Also because we cannot patch the cars, really. But security engineering does not start from getting the single vulnerabilities. That's the end. Security engineering does not start with um, bug bounties. It starts from security design, goes on with security in the development, and then the bug bounty or the penetration test is kind of the last thing. The thing that helps you fill in the holes that, have, that are left. But if everything is a hole, starting from the penetration test is not a very good idea. In particular, if those holes you cannot really fill. So we don't need a way to design invulnerable networks because this would basically mean picking up all that has been done until now, throwing it away, and starting from scratch. In the automotive industry, this is never going to happen. The automotive industry does not redesign anything from scratch. Each model is designed based on the knowledge and based on the previous platforms that are updated, they add an ECU, they modify some code, but they start from designs that they already have. So what we need to do is figure out a way to model the risk, understand which are the components on those networks that need to be fixed, and give to the automotive industry the specifications, the blueprint, on how to do the same things uh, not securely, because security is not a state that can be attained. You cannot make a network secure. You cannot make a computer secure. You want to make it secure enough against the specific types of attacks and threat vectors that create risk. And you need to be able to assess the risk. <laughs> so basically, what we wanted to do was create a risk, a risk assessment process that we could teach automotive designers in order to make them more security aware. Because these people are not cybersecurity experts. There's a handful of people in the world, I can name them and I have them on speed dial in my phone, that can understand both cybersecurity in depth and automotive in depth. Most of the people that have hacked cars are not automotive experts. So there are some things here and there that uh, they lack in their understanding. They understood them over time because they studied it. On the other hand, the people that are going to be responsible for implementing this are never going to be us. Automotive industry will not hire one of us to do security of their vehicles. What they want to do is to create awareness of these security issues in their designers. And so we needed to figure out a way to give these designers a, a chance to understand the security issues. Um, and in particular, we wanted to create a tool that could support this design. So the intuition from which we started is this. Usually, when you do risk assessments in enterprise environments, you do them on a very large scale. Because an enterprise is a very complex thing. You have many types of risk to entail. It's human risk, there's all sorts of things that you need to take into account. So this means that there are no real good risk assessment software. You cannot really build a risk assessment software. There are some, but they are basically little more than databases for you to fill in. But a, a car 
is a specific environment. It's much smaller than an enterprise. And in reality, it's almost always the same thing. It has four wheels, it has an engine. Sometimes it costs more, sometimes it costs less. But more or less, the problem is constrained from a computer scientist's point of view. Then automotive engineers spend their lives in creating cars that are better and nicer and faster. But from a computer security point of view, this is not an enormously difficult problem. And actually, most of the risks can be mapped on the topology of the network, because those networks have a fixed topology that is more or less always similar. Uh, let me show you uh, how uh, we did this uh, going through a process where we started from the, uh, analyzing the assets, getting to the threats, creating what we know attack trees. But the, for the uh, automotive industry, this is not a model that is uh, particularly in use and map them on what they can understand. I, I will go through these step by step so I don't spend and waste time on this slide. So the first step for any security uh, risk assessment, what is it? It's the asset definition. You figure out what are the important things that you want to protect. And really, if you're looking at cars, there's four things. It's always the same four things. There's the safety of, of the operations of the car. There's the value of the car, the vehicle itself. There's the possibility of having private information, such as the location of the vehicle or where the vehicle traveled, leak. And there's the intellectual property built into the car. Those are the four assets that for an OEM, for a manufacturer of cars, are important. Then, if you are an operator of a fleet of cars, for instance, take the example of what Uber will probably be if they end up building their own self-driving vehicles or modified self-driving vehicles, they are going to have a fleet of cars that they operate. So for them, the risk equation is different. But if you think about it, what is going to be at stake is always the same thing. The safety of the operations of the cars, uh, the value of the cars, because they could be stolen or they could be destroyed, the intellectual property built into the self-driving component of the cars, and the private information of their, uh, of their renters or of their riders. So if you think about it, any scenario that you can, can, you can build with attacking a car ends up in these four parts. Then there's a lot of other things. So for instance, if you are an OEM, one of the things you care about is the brand. When Fiat Chrysler had that issue, their brand took a hit, obviously. Was it a very severe hit? Not really. If you look at, uh, the, um, at their um, trading on the stock trading, uh, it was not very severe. But that, that's something that, uh, that an OEM carried you know, cares about. My cars explode. <laughs> that's, that's a very significant threat. But a brand can be impacted only as a result of these four things. Because the cars are unsafe, because the cars can be stolen, because the cars <coughs> leak private information. There's no other way that the car security can impact the brand. So if you are looking at car security, those four things are the only four things that you care about. Now compare this with risk assessment in an enterprise. In an enterprise, there's gazillions of things that you can care about, gazillions of things that you need to protect. This is much simpler. So let's move to the other component of risk, threat. Who is uh, targeting these cars? Well, there's a set of examples there. Hackers, researchers, the Charlie, uh, the Charlie Millers of, uh, of the world. There's the thieves. Uh, there's tuners, the people that modify the performances of cars. They are interested in accessing in an illegal way, not illegal in the sense of a law, but illegal in the sense of not allowed by policy of the, of the OEM, the uh, entities on the camp. Uh, we could have, in the future, ransomware for cars, for instance. Why not? If now you, they lock your phone to try to extort your ransom, why not locking up your car? 
a hundred euros for unlocking or a uh, hundred dollars for unlocking your car instead of having to wait for the dealer to come and refresh it. Ah, a lot of people are going to pay for that. So if this, if this happens, it's not going to be me, but you can thank me for having told you in advance. Um, your competitors may be willing to attack your vehicle network to extract uh, IP from it. Um, or there can be targeted attacks. All of the scenarios where there's somebody like uh, um, 007 wanting to kill somebody, yeah, all those scenarios can happen, of course. Now, what we do usually when we do risk assessment in the uh, IT world is we try to rank these, uh, um, these threats, right? So help me rank these threats, which is the, in your, just focus on these. There may be others, but focus on this. Which is the most common, the most likely to happen? It's actually very easy. I told you already. The second, like theft. Theft is the most common one. The one that we also know most about, because all of us, when our car is stolen, we go to the police and say that it has been stolen. Insurances have historical data of stealing of cars ranking back in generations. So that's the most common one. If you had to choose uh, another one, the second most common, much, much less common than theft. But the second most common, which one would it be? Anybody? Oh, come on. I didn't hear you. Try that again, louder. Okay. I think I think we are I think we, we may have a, a misaligned definition. So I'm not asking which are the most dangerous. I'm asking which are the most likely to happen. Those that happen more often. Okay? So in my personal perception, the one that happens most often by far is theft. It has been happening for ages, it's going to happen still for ages. Maybe not so much in the future. So if in the future we go towards a model where people, instead of driving and owning a car, just share the cars, hire the cars for a moment, then you will not steal the cars because there's nobody to sell them to. But that's a far away future, pretty far away future. I will be, I will be retired by then, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with not considering that scenario. Um, the, the, second, uh, the second ranking, uh, you, can you can debate it. There are several possible candidates there. Um, one candidate could be the tuners. There's a lot of tuners around in the world. Um, aftermarket sellers that want to sell you aftermarket devices that connect to the car and do some things that are not, the car is not designed to do. Uh, they can be also not, uh, not necessarily malicious, right, in their own. Uh, so for instance, uh, take uh, the uh, latest announcement by uh, um, a very famous hacker, Geo Hotz, George Hotz. Um, Geo Hot announced that he has a company that wants to make regular cars self-driving. Like an aftermarket device that you plug into your car to turn the sensors that are already on board the cars and the actuators that are already there into a self-driving car. That's probably something that many OEMs will, re will consider a very invasive modification of their vehicle. So that's something that some OEMs could consider, I don't know if they will, but they could consider it a threat. Somebody selling a third party modification tool that changes the behavior of the car in a very significant way. A competitor is a very potential threat and I think all competitors study each other's cars, that's, that's an open secret. Um, researchers are a very likely threat in many ways for cars right now in particular. So really the actual cybercrime, non-theft cybercrime it's pretty low in the list, in my list, in my perception. I may be wrong, you may correct me, but in my list it's pretty low. And even lower 
there's targeted attacks. Is this always true? Not really. If you are, for instance, uh, I don't know, Ferrari or uh, uh, Maserati, one high-end luxury car, you may have a division that creates cars for, for instance, chiefs of state. Or you may be a vendor that uh, sells some types of vehicles to the military. In those cases, those priorities may be shifted. But for a general non-luxury car, this is more or less a reasonable ranking. Right now, tomorrow it could be different. This is an issue, because if uh, tomorrow, for instance, ransomware becomes very, very likely, then our priorities in designing secure cars uh, shift. And the issue is, what do I do if this uh, shift? How can I change the behavior of the vehicles that are already there in order to handle this threat? So you see that we need a very good way to document these choices, these design choices, and to be able to simulate what happens if one of these design choices changes. Let's take the basic example, theft. Why am I taking it? Because it's A, the most likely thing to happen. It's something that we all understand. We don't even need to go in depth into difficult um, analysis of the car. And uh, um, it's also going to be kind of the worry of most major manufacturers. If we go to talk to them about the security of their electronics, that's kind of the first thing. Because that's one of the things that they already care about, even before all of this hacking started. So what are the calls of an attacker that is trying to steal a vehicle? Well, this is also easy. Most of the attackers that I have shown have more complicated uh, scenarios that they can play. But a thief wants to do only one thing. They want to steal a vehicle. So we can actually build what uh, we call an attack tree. And you have seen them, because those are, are a very normal model for us to think about security. But they are not normal for the security, for the car industry. They use safety trees which are very different. Because in a safety tree, which is the type of tree that you use in mechanical engineering, for instance, for uh, analyzing the possible impact of defects uh, or of breakage, there is a very important assumption. Things break randomly. In attacks, things do not break randomly. There's somebody actively trying to find the best possible way, the best possible combination of things to break. So attack trees are very different, and they are used in a different way. The automotive industry is not used to, to raise them like this. So for theft, and this is a simplified version of an attack tree for theft. It's just for this example in, in, in this conference. But for theft, you have different ways to steal a car. Well, of course, you can physically steal it. You just grab it and take it away. That's, that's one way to steal a car. But if you want to steal it electronically, there's basically two big areas that you can go and target. One area is uh, trying to replicate the signal of the key. That's one area. The other area is trying to make the car start even if the key says that it should not start. So the two, uh, it's these two possibilities that I see over there. Activating ignition on the one side, so turning the key, even if you don't have the key or generating traction, making the car move even if the, even the uh, ignition is not active, activated. In order to activate ignition, you need to do two things, basically, on most modern cars. Those two things are you need to um, make the so-called immobilizer say it's OK to run the car. The immobilizer is an electronic device that basically reads a signal of some sort generated electronically from the car key in order to avoid you mechanically, if you still have a car with a mechanical key, mechanically making the car start. Okay? So you need to generate the immobilization signal, <coughs> and you need to create the signal that says to the engine, start. So generating the run command is one part, and you also need to generate the, the immobilization signal, which you can obtain in two different ways. You can either tell the immobilizer is you, OK, there's the immobilizer key near you, start. 
or you can generate on the CAN, generate on the network of the vehicle, a fake message that says, uh, I'm the immobilizer, everything's good, you can start. Okay, there's these two approaches. You can go the other way around, and in order to make the car start, even if there's no key, you need to do two things. Create torque, make the engine actually spin the wheels, and shift the gear from park to drive. In order to provide torque, there is a, a specific ECU that is, going to, that is actually going to activate the engine for you. So you can just control that ECU. This tree could be much broader because you can do this in other ways. I'm just, I'm just giving you a demonstration of the fact that there are different paths to get to the same goal. Okay. Now, a network of a, um, of a modern vehicle, this is a 2010 vehicle that I will not name because I don't have the permission to name what it is and it's uh, sufficiently anonymized that, it's, uh, that it doesn't really look uh, uh, recognizable. Oh, by the way, uh, all of the things that I'm showing, the graphs, are not generated just for this presentation. They come out of the tool that we are building. Um, so this is a vehicle uh, represented uh, along the different portions of the CAN network and the different entities that are connected to those portions. So all of those ECUs are the same ECUs that are involved in this attack tree. So we can basically map what the attacker needs to do onto the CAN. So this is the attack tree, that's the can. So for instance, if we want to go and proceed by activating ignition, we need to do both of the things that are down here. Either of those goals, generate the immobilization signal and generate the run command, can be obtained, well, generate the run command by sending the run command, so by controlling the PCM. Uh, the immobilization signal can be sent either by controlling the uh, immobilizer or by transmitting the immobilizer go signal on the can. So either you control, let me put those in evidence, either, so you need to control this, you need to control this in order to obtain this goal. Plus, you can either control the immobilizer or just Control the can, control can C, because if you control can C, this is the immobilizer, if you are here, you can just say, hey, I'm the immobilizer, start. Okay, so you have two different ways to do this. Either you control those two components, or you can control these two components. Either of these is going to uh, satisfy your, um, your need for a new vehicle. Or, alternatively, you can go down the other, uh, the other uh, part of the tree. So you, can, you want to provide traction, you want to provide torque and shift the gear. In order to, command, to create the torque, you need to control the TCM. In order to shift the gear, you can either uh, use the TCM and uh, basically enter the drive gear as if it was selected by the drive gear. Or you can request the change, which is what the TCM is going to do. You can do that by controlling the other ECU that is physically controlling the, uh, the gear. Or if you are on the can, you can just say, hey, somebody has requested this car to go from park to drive. And since nobody authenticates can messages, that's also going to work. So you have different ways to do it. Once again, simplified model just to give you an idea of how you need to bring those towards the can. Because at this point, you know that if you want to steal a vehicle, basically whatever you want to do, you will need to reach the PCM. And then, one of the best ways that you can steal a vehicle, according to this very simple analysis that we run together, is by controlling the can C. If you can control the can C, in general, you can bypass anything else that is controlling the vehicle. To be honest, in order to steal a vehicle of this type, you need to have those two things that are in the brighter red over there. If you are controlling those, you can have the vehicle. Now the question is, you are outside the vehicle. 
How do you get inside the vehicle? All of these uh, pinkish components that you see here are interfaces that are outside the vehicle. This CAN network is actually pretty much embedded inside the vehicle. The attacker can reach all of the other points. So if you are an attacker, an example vector of ingress is this one. This connector that you see here is the OBD2 port. It's not really the OBD2 port, but it's connected behind the OBD2 port. And it's connected to the TIPM, which is the module that on this specific type of vehicles controls basically everything that gets transmitted between the OBD2 port and the internal part of the CAN. It's the gateway that you were referring to earlier. So this gateway needs to be designed securely. Everybody knows that already. But after this analysis, I can tell to the designer of this gateway precisely which things this gateway should not allow to flow between here and there. I can also tell the designer, for instance, if he's designing an intrusion detection system for the CAN, which is something that most uh, automotives are starting to fail to put in there, but they don't know which attacks or which types of messages they need to be scared about. Now we know which messages somebody trying to steal the vehicle is going to generate. If we replicate this analysis for all of the scenarios, we can generate A, the specifications for the most important pieces of that network, B, the intrusion detection rules that can be applied on the different portions of the CAN, and C, which is very important, if you are a conscientious uh, OEM, and after you have designed your network, you run a penetration test on it, you don't give a penetration test uh, just the device, like the TIPM, and say, test it. Because then, the um, penetration tester does not know which objective they need to achieve. They will come back to you with a lot of things that they found, but they are not necessarily the things that you care about. Instead, by plotting this, you can tell the penetration tester, what I want you to do is try to make this TIPM generate specifically this list of messages. This TIPM should never go into this condition. And that's a much more targeted, a more effective way to test the device. Um, this actually responds uh, to um, a standard that has been re recently uh, released. When we started working on this, um, J3061 was recently released. Um, J3061 is the first cybersecurity standard for vehicles, January 2016. SAE is the uh, Society of Automotive Engineers, so it's the body that actually generates most of the safety and security standards that you apply in vehicles. So this is the first cybersecurity recommendation for vehicles. It's very recent. It's very recent. And uh, um, actually, if you go through it, it's a bit costly to get one to get a copy of it. But if you uh, uh, get uh, your hands on a copy. Um, it actually describes a process that is um, pretty much um, it pretty much requires an analysis process such as the one that I showed to you. Um, they uh, use a, a, so a model called EBITDA uh, that uh, um, basically specifies a series of severity classes. I'm not going in depth into this. But if you look at the titles of those columns, you will see that they are different from the, from the four assets that I showed to you at the beginning. Operations, vehicle, uh, private information, and IP. But if you look at the descriptions, they are basically the same four things. So you can map precisely the same thing that we are saying to the standard. It's, it, it, it can generate the same output. <laughs> so in conclusion, um, what I've showed is a risk-based security design process for automotive networks, a simplified method that can be applied blindly to uh, a network uh, of devices such as uh, CAN network PVCUs, um, and that can be automated. And in fact, we are automating it. So um, I, uh, I cannot give access openly to the tool. But if anybody who has attended the talk wants to write me in private, 
uh, as soon as we are able to give access externally to the tool, I would be very happy if anybody who is already interested in designing or specifying components for automotive networks, if, they, if you want to give us feedback, that would be absolutely appreciated. And we would be very happy to have um, people that do tests for us use the tool for free. So that's, that's going to be free access for anybody that wants to contribute uh, from the community point of view. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions on cars, uh, you should probably ask Eric, but I will try my best. And uh, if you want to give us feedback, those are our email addresses and those are um, the Twitter handles, so you can heckle us on Twitter as well. Heckle Eric, he is not here, so for me you can do it in person, for him just tweet to him. Thank you very much. Questions? It's late. I'm going to be around. I'm going to be drunk tonight, but tomorrow I should be probably okay. So you can ask me tomorrow about anything else. Thank you very much. <laughs>